Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's conversation about climate change with Conrad Anker, Dr. John All, Amy Gulick, and Florian Schultz. We're incredibly honored to host these special guests. My name is Betsy Robley, and I'm the Conservation and Advocacy Director at the Mountaineers. Just a quick reminder that tonight's conversation is being recorded, and we ask that you keep yourself muted with your video off. Our panel is excited to field your questions, which you can submit through the chat box. Feel free to say hello if you'd like as well. Before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm coming to you virtually from the ancestral land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. The Mountaineers are grateful for their stewardship of our land since time immemorial. The topic of tonight's conversation is front of mind to me and many of us these days as devastating wildfires across the West have been fueled by human-caused climate change and underscore the urgency of action. The Mountaineers community is actively experiencing the impacts of the global climate crisis. As the glaciers we climb are melting and smoke shrouds are summertime hikes and even our neighborhoods. The Mountaineers is uniquely positioned to address the climate crisis. Our conservation and advocacy efforts engage a community of outdoor enthusiasts who have deep connections to the landscapes of the Pacific Northwest and beyond. And when those landscapes are threatened, they show up in high numbers to protect and steward the wild places they love. This community engagement, coupled with significant policy expertise and partnerships with national groups like Outdoor Alliance, a strong potential to move the needle on climate advocacy, just as we have with protecting public lands. Mountaineers books, and especially our conservation imprint, Braided River, has been educating people on the impacts of climate change and inspiring them to take action for decades. We've published books like The Big Thaw, which just today won the Washington State Book Award in partnership with leading scientists. Braided River's books and strategic communications campaigns and partnerships to protect public lands from Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and Tongass National Forest to the North Cascades have influenced decisions at the highest levels of our society. Thanks to generous donors and passionate volunteers like yourselves, we've also taken tremendous steps to reduce our carbon footprint. We've installed solar panels on the roof of the Seattle Program Center and replaced old light fixtures with more efficient LED lighting in both our Seattle and Tacoma Program Centers and at Mountaineers Books. While we're committed to doing our part, there's so much more to be done. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to share a special welcome message from one of our nation's leaders on climate, our very own Senator Maria Cantwell. As Washingtonians, we're incredibly lucky to be represented by one of the Senate's strongest advocates for our environment and public lands. Her longtime leadership on the Land and Water Conservation Fund was instrumental in passing the Great American Outdoors Act 
and she's been a vocal opponent of drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And she's a mountaineer and an avid hiker to boot. And we're honored that she could share a few words with us tonight. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks for that kind introduction. And thanks to Tom and the rest of the team and the Mountaineers for the opportunity to participate in this event. I'm disappointed I can't join you uh, there with the rest of the uh, people who are speaking on the panel, but I know they're going to do such an important job, so I'm very happy to even be included as part of tonight's event. Florian Schulz, Amy Gullick, Dr. John All, and of course, Conrad Anker. All of them have contributed so much to our understanding and our desires to move forward in a changing world when we know so much is at stake. Our nation is facing incredible challenges right now, but we cannot afford to forget about the looming climate crisis. We've made a lot of progress in decarbonization of our economy and preserving our natural spaces, but the number and scale of natural disasters we've endured over the past few years have been so dominant that we need to do much, much more to respond. And I want to make sure that everybody understands those warning signs. They've been etched into the mountains and our outdoor spaces that we love. When the road to Rainier was built in the 1900s, it passed nearly the end of the Nisqually Glacier. Now the glacier ends a mile further up the mountain. All told, Rainier, which has the largest collection of glaciers on a single peak outside of Alaska, it has lost about 18% of the snow volume in the last 50 years. That means less water for our rivers like the Skagit and the White and our local water supplies for farmers and salmon and our communities at large. Climate change is making our region drier and certainly shifting the historic water cycles. All of this is making it more challenging in our forests. They have become timber boxes and we've all seen what the horrific fires have done this year. So all of this is cascading costs on our health, on our economy, and on our environment. Not only are climate-fueled fires incinerating our pristine natural lands, the resulting oppressive smoke is trapping us at home, but obviously it's impacting our outdoor recreation opportunities as well. Well, it's not too late to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. I'm sure this panel tonight is going to discuss, talk about advocacy, science, education, and I know there'll be a little bit of inspiration about how we can make real change. Exhibit A is the passionate appeal and coalition building by the Mountaineers themselves. They have been great in their support of the Great American Outdoors Act, which we signed into law, the bill that permanently funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund at $900 million a year, to the historic levels that we want to see. And those dollars are going to help us with what we know we can do in sequestering carbon and protecting our precious water supplies. So these dollars will preserve open space, protect wetlands, buffer our communities, and help us move forward. So for Washington, the permanent land and water conservation fund means an extra $20 million a year to invest in projects that help us protect our outdoors. All of these kinds of investments are a need to double down on the impacts and the changes that we are seeing. So while I remain hopeful that we will continue to make progress, we've done a lot in the last several years to shift the focus into incentivizing cleaner sources of energy. This has been so important and we need to continue to do that. We have shown that we can make a transition to cleaner cars and it hasn't hurt our economy, it's helped our economy. We are moving towards cleaner sources of other types of transportation and we need to be fervent in that. We need to show that decarbonizing our economy is possible, it grows jobs, and certainly helps us save our planet. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Can't wait to hear what the rest of the speakers have to say. It's so great to have Senator Cantwell beam in from Washington, D.C. and join us uh, this evening. That really framed up the conversation really well. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our esteemed panel, 
we have Dr. John All, a mountaineering climate scientist. Conrad Inker, professional climber and environmental activist. Amy Gulick, nature photographer and braided river, river author. And Florian Schultz, photographer, filmmaker, and braided river author. I'd love for each of our panelists to introduce themselves through asking, answering the following question. What's one event in your life that's most inspired you to advocate for addressing the climate crisis? And let's uh, start with Florian. Oop, we're not hearing you, Florian. Maybe let's go to Amy while Florian gets set up. Okay, uh, all right, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay, great. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things, uh, you know, that gets me thinking about climate change. And I think for all of us, we can, I think it's kind of easy to intellectually understand how climate change is affecting the entire planet and all living beings on it. But for me, I'm gonna tell you a very specific story. Two years ago, um, climate change got very personal uh, for me. I was in Alaska, I was helping a native woman her name is Michelle Raven Moon, and uh, you can read all about her in my uh, new book uh, called The Salmon Way. So I was helping her put up salmon uh, for the winter. It was early July, and this is a very crucial time of year for Michelle and for others like her who rely on wild salmon for half of their diet. And normally in early July, where she lives, it's uh, cool and wet during this time, and so I packed rain gear and extra layers. Now, what I didn't have um, that I could have used were shorts, a tank top, and flip-flops. And while that may sound like pleasant conditions to work in, um, it's absolutely disastrous for salmon. Salmon are cold-blooded creatures, and so they need cool water, and they need just the right amount of water at just the right time, uh, none of which was happening. There were record-breaking temperatures all across Alaska, and major wildfires uh, were burning. So Michelle set her net um, to catch salmon where she and her family had placed it for her entire life and for decades before she was born. And day after day, no fish. Um, so Michelle had to make the very difficult decision uh, to move the net to deeper, colder water where there might be salmon. Now, she lives on Iliamna Lake. This is the largest lake in Alaska, and it's the eighth largest uh, lake in the United States. So to move the net to deeper water, this meant going farther out onto the lake where it's more exposed. And just the slightest bit of wind turns this lake into a very dangerous place. Uh, years before, two of Michelle's brothers drowned uh, on this lake uh, during a storm. So we moved the net, and um, we started catching salmon. Um, her, her uh, theory worked, uh, but it took longer, it required more fuel, and it put Michelle's safety uh, at considerably more risk. And then that winter, she and her partner fell through the ice while riding their snow machines across the lake. Now keep in mind, there are no roads where she lives and people don't have cars. So in the winter, snow machines are their transportation and frozen lakes and rivers are their roads. Now, I share this story because it's a real life example of how climate change is affecting the way of life for someone that I know and uh, who I care about. Wow, quite the story. Thanks, Amy. Florian, do we have you now? Uh, we can try. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. Um, Amy just mentioned uh, the summer last year in Alaska. We live here in Anchorage and for over two months we had the smoke that you have now down south. So we just see that regularly occurring. For me, it was though uh, when I was at the COP conference in Copenhagen, when I actually understood that climate change wasn't anymore just about, you know, warmer temperature, that it was actually a change in chemistry. And it was like a a talk and panel about ocean acidification. And when I realized on what a profound level we're changing the ocean and the chemistry and what this actually means besides the temperatures alone. I myself had situations in the Arctic when I was traveling across uh, the coast or along the coast of Baffin Island, for example, that on traditional routes where I was traveling with in, um, Inuit families that they suddenly had to really watch areas where uh, the ice was getting so thin and where they couldn't get to their hunting grounds anymore. 
But what was a problem in the Arctic then, I think now we all see very clearly it's affecting the entire world. It just had a certain delay effect. But sooner or later, we're all feeling the consequences, not just uh, the native people in the Arctic, what used to be just the, the one thought as who's going to be affected. Yeah, absolutely. The Arctic is a canary in the coal mine for sure. Yeah, and now we all around the world are experiencing the issues in just the same strong effect now. Yeah. yeah. Conrad, how about you? <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone, um, for the invitation to be here. So spring of 1989, I was in the Alaska range as a climber, and that was uh, when the Exxon Valdez ran aground and there was the oil spill. And this was before the internet and the technology that we're now, now so tethered to. So we had Alaska NPR and they had um, great reporting of it. And I sort of came to understand the severity of it. And being in the range, in the Alaska range uh, at that time, when I was uh, with my mentor, who was um, a generation older than I am, who had um, been inspired by, um, the environmental awareness and the cultural awareness, the societal awareness of the 1960s. So it became something to be there. And then reinforcing that is um, as climbers, we look at mountains and we see different things in them. From a climbing route standpoint, where um, our history began as oral history and then written history, uh, photographic history. And so when we go back and revisit those uh, historical landmarks as the Mountaineers has a great catalog of um, all of that, we can see how immediate uh, climate changes in relation to the um, how much uh, glaciers have shrunk. So seeing those two is uh, um, the, the catalyst for my climate uh, motivation or climate awareness uh, effort. Thanks, Conrad. And John, what about you? Um, so I, I've been studying climate my whole career and I was you know, working in the Andes and other places but where it really became personal was uh, in 2014 I was leading the NSF team to sample on Mount Everest and a uh, huge block of ice that should have been stable collapsed and killed uh, a lot of Sherpa including a part of my team and basically devastated the work we were doing um, but the local Nepali people were so excited about the fact that we were trying to find out what was happening to the mountains and what was going to happen to them in the future, that they uh, worked together to, to get the permits and everything for us to move on from that. And then I went to another mountain and fell 70 feet into a crevasse um, because they're, they're opening up everywhere. So in this one short time period, I, you know, my friends died, I almost died. And it's because the mountains are melting beneath our feet so quickly. And so the years of working around the world had sort of intellectualized that, but it didn't really become personal until that point, so. Yeah, and if our audience hasn't um, Googled that video to watch, please <laughs> do. It's, it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> so thanks for that, John. Um, my next question is uh, right back to you, John. Uh, you approach climate, the climate crisis from the intersection of science and adventure which I think is a really interesting perspective for our community. Can you uh, talk a little bit about what science is telling us about the impacts of climate change on the greater ranges of the world? Well, and the reason I approach it from that intersection is you, you basically have to. I mean, climate change is occurring in places like Iowa, but they're not as vulnerable to climate change as the high mountains of the world or the Arctic. And so that's why I've spent a lot of my career working in these places. and. Um, uh, what we're seeing is that we basically have, are changing the planet. We're creating a new planet, and you know, that's where it's hitting the first. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is when you think about it, um, Mount Everest is at the same latitude as Tampa, Florida. And so it should be a very warm, well, at its base, it's tropical vegetation. And then you very quickly move up into some of the, one of the coldest places on Earth. And so in the past, mountains have always been these, these protected areas of cold, uh, where you could have snow, where animals could retreat. It was a refuge during ice ages. And all of that's changing and it's disappearing. The gl glaciers are gone, the water tower um, that we've had in the past, all that's disappearing. And um, uh, the fires we've seen, the, um, 
changes in species movement. And so from a, uh, an American standpoint, most of our mountains are protected and we tend to think of things like recreation. But most of parts of the rest of the world, people live in the mountains and they farm there, they raise livestock there, they raise their families there. And so when we talk about uh, climate change here, it's uh, in the mountains, it's sort of an academic exercise, like I mentioned, but there it's their survival. And so um, you've had it change in, in kind of good and bad ways. When it gets uh, warmer, you lose the ice, you change patterns, but it also it's warmer. And so people don't die of uh, frostbite. I mean, not frostbite, of cold injuries. They don't get frostbite as often. They have longer growing seasons so they can do more agriculture. They can grow different crops. And so um, when you try and look at climate change around the world, it, like I said, in these mountains, it's, it's transforming every system. So any, anything you think you know from uh, reading the books or anything else of what climate used to look like, it wasn't, you know, 10 years ago, it was totally different. And 10 years from now, it'll be utterly, utterly unrecognizable. Um, so essentially, every major system is being changed kind of at the same time. And um, of course, we're most concerned uh, in a lot of ways with water because everyone needs it for agriculture, for cities. Um, we see it, uh, the changes in our own uh, mountains as well as uh, down in California's dependence on water. Uh, of course, the, Andi, uh, the Andes provide it for the major cities of South America. Uh, the Himalayas provide it for China and for India. And so the disappearance of that water is the most obvious and recognizable change in the mountains. But the impact on the ecosystems in both natural ecosystems in protected areas and human ecosystems, which include agriculture and grazing, is uh, dramatic across the board. Um, I don't know, it's such a broad question. It's difficult to answer because so many things are changing so drastically. Yeah, absolutely. And you've seen a lot of it up close and personal. Yeah, when, sure. I, when I hear water, I think salmon. I wonder if you could um, piggyback on that, Amy, and talk about what melting glaciers mean for the salmon up in Alaska that you have photographed and studied. Right. Well, I mean, again, salmon, salmon are cold-blooded creatures, and so they need, they need cold water, and they need just the right amount of water, and they need just the right amount or at just the right time. And climate change is really disrupting a lot of that. Um, one of the very interesting things I learned when I was working on my book, I spent time with a um, stream ecologist, and she's been doing a lot of water temperature monitoring. Um, which has been very interesting. So what's, and she's trying to establish a baseline to just get an idea of what is happening in all of these different salmon systems, what's happening to the temperature. Um, and they're finding very, very interesting things. But what it's, what it's going, hopefully what that study is going to help land managers and salmon managers do in Alaska is determine where are the cold spots in the state and where are the hot spots. You know, there will be streams and entire systems that probably will become too hot for salmon, but, but they don't quite know exactly like which ones those are yet. So that's what the study is trying to determine. But there will be those that will, that will remain cold, you know, whether they're spring fed uh, or, you know, glacier fed is still good at this point. Um, and so it's helping them prioritize. It's like, where do we put our money? Where do we put our resources? in helping the ones that have a really good chance of you know, remaining good habitat for salmon. You know, let's put all of our resources there and work on making those, say, more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And the ones that um, maybe there's not a whole lot we can do, uh, maybe we don't put a lot of resources into that. So it's, it's just helping them, uh, again, determine you know, these hot and these cold spots and, and, and where to prioritize uh, the work because there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to um, help these um, salmon systems uh, stay resilient, those that can be. Thank you for that. That's a really interesting perspective. Conrad, um, I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about what conversations about climate are happening in the global climbing community. Yeah, thank you. And um, to echo John and his comment with uh, the people of Nepal that live in the mountains, that for them, um, what's going on there. And so Nepal um, is a small landlocked nation and their um, um, per capita con uh, consumption of carbon is not that of what it is in the United States. So they're feeling the effects of it very real because they're very much connected to the 
uh, mountains and in there. And so seeing that effect for them, there isn't a question about whether climate change is real or not. It's about how soon can we get to uh, work on doing things. And that same outlook and mindset is reflected in um, the mountaineering community. So within the, um, the, the professional mountaineering community, there isn't a one of us that's like, no, climate change isn't real. We all get it um, and we are all understanding about it. And whether it's in um, skiing or, um, or uh, particularly mountain climbing where you're on uh, peaks that have uh, water in the form of glaciers, then it really affects with that. And so everyone's very aware of it. And um, we're, as the, the saying is, we're there to, uh, to speak on behalf of the mountains and, and to share what we're seeing up there. And that's um, a key part of what motivates us. Thanks, Conrad. To follow up on that, um, Amy, and Flor Amy and Florian, your work is focused on the Alaska Native populations, and they're similar to the Nepalese um, experiencing the impacts of climate change at an accelerated rate. Um, what are some things you've learned about these from these communities about how they're responding to the climate crisis and building resiliency? I, I think it's. Um probably pretty difficult to say exactly, you know, how quickly and in which ways they are able to build resiliency or, or what they can specifically do. The nations that I work with are, for example, the Gwich'in uh, people that are uh, south of the uh, Brooks Range in northeastern Alaska. I think for them right now, one of the important fights is actually just that they can maintain their food sources, which, which mainly is the caribou. And so for them, it becomes clear that the caribou have sustained them for millennia. And right now, you know, this administration is specifically doing something that could possibly harm them. I think in there, there's not very many things that they can do uh, to um, actually, you know, like change anything about that to be, to, you know, it's just too big of, a, of an issue, right? Um, and, and so I think that's kind of one of the most essential fights. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all I can say on that topic specifically about the native community. Yeah, and I, I can add a little bit to that. I'd like to go back to um, Michelle Raven Moon, the, the woman I, I told you about um, earlier. And because I always try and kind of make this personal because I, I think climate change can just be too abstract, you know, for, for many of us, for me, um, certainly. And so, you know, going back to Michelle, you know, she's facing the very real possibility of maybe having to leave her home. And um, kind of want all of us to think about, you know, what does that mean? You know, especially for indigenous people, you know, who've not only lived on their traditional homelands their entire lives, but in the case of Alaska Natives, you know, four or five, some 10,000 years. Um, you know, that's a hard concept for many of us to wrap our heads around. Um, so, you know, think about that, leaving everything they know and their, you know, their deep, deep connections, you know, to the land and the waters and the wildlife. Um, you know, and for someone like me, I could probably pick up and go somewhere else and I'm, I land on my feet and I probably do okay because this is the world I'm used to, you know, this is the world that I know, but you know, for indigenous people, for someone like Michelle, you know, to have to leave her homelands and, you know, go to say a city like Anchorage, I mean, that's just not her world. Um, and so I think when indigenous people have to leave their traditional homelands, you know, they're, they're losing their culture, you know, their knowledge, you know, their connections to what nourishes both their body and spirit. And, and, and then how does that affect us? And, and here's the thing I really learned, uh, again, when I was working on my book. Um, you know, when they, when indigenous, when indigenous people lose their connections to the land and we, the rest of us, we lose the stewards uh, of that land. Um, everywhere I went um, when I was working on my book and everyone I met, you know, whose whole life is intertwined and revolves around salmon, they all told me, they said, you take care of what takes care of you. And so the salmon people of Alaska, they're taking care of their home stream and ensuring that the salmon can come back and they can spawn and that can continue to go on because the salmon are taking care of them. So they live in a very reciprocal uh, relationship. It's a very beautiful um, 
way to live. And I, I know that we all want solutions, you know, to climate change and, and we want ways to make the world more resilient to climate change. And I do think that there are places where maybe we can, we can do this, we can do this kind of work. Um, but I do want to say, and, and not to be a Debbie Downer, and those of you who know me, you know, that's, that's not how I operate. I'm usually like an incredible optimist, right? But, um, you know, in many instances, you know, this just might not be possible. And, and I want us all to think about what it means for people um, who are going to become what academically we do call uh, climate refugees. And, and think of Michelle, you know, and, and, and leaving her homeland and all of her people leaving too. Um, it's very real possibility, especially in a place like Alaska, where the rate of change um, from the impacts of climate change is just, it, it's mind boggling how quickly uh, changes are happening up there. That's such a wonderful point that, you know, when we think about the impacts of climate change on indigenous communities, we're, we're talking about our stewards. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, John, what about you? What about the impacts of um, people in the Himalaya? Or I know you've done a lot of work in the Andes. What have you seen there? The thing that's really interesting about both those groups is um, kind of the similarities and the differences. Because, I mean, they both have had to uh, find ways to survive throughout the millennia uh, in these really uh, remote, um, vulnerable areas. And so uh, in the Himalayas, there's a lot, a uh, very long tradition of trade. So Tibetans trade with Nepalis and uh, um, in Nepal, I mean, in uh, the Andes, it's more a question of uh, kind of a diverse agriculture. So the Incas, for example, uh, really pioneered uh, kind of a complex high level agriculture. Um, but the similarities you see in both cases is diversification by finding better ways to um, there are more complex ways to live. So rather than just depending on tourism or just depending on agriculture or just depending on grazing, the more that the local people can pull those things together so that if one fails, if you have COVID and there's no tourism, they have the agriculture to fall back on. And so that diversification of economic activity is really what's um, the more successful uh, communities throughout history have uh, use that strategy and we're finding more and more with climate change that that's the step people are moving forward with. A really great example is growing uh, vegetables. So now plastics become cheap, uh, there's a lot of tourist demand in these high mountain areas and so what you're seeing is these little mini greenhouses the local people are using. So whereas in the past maybe they grew uh, potatoes or some sort of grain, now they're growing uh, vegetables which they can sell for a lot more money um, in um, kind of these local areas, both because it's becoming warmer, um, so the conditions are different, but then also um, it allows them to pull money in versus just subsistence agriculture. So again, that diversification across the board in both areas is really becoming important. Yeah, diversification for resiliency, I like that. Mm -hmm, exactly. Conrad, did you, you look like you had something to add there. I'm listening to it and <laughs> I'm taking notes here and I have to write down uh, thoughts as they, as they come across, so Great. yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, this is a question for Amy and Florian. Uh, your Braided River books have strategically aligned with legislation to protect wild places. And this requires uh, strategy and strong partnerships. Tell us a little bit about the role that uh, the books played in these uh, legislative and policy successes. I don't know if I, I th thinking back about the different books, you know, starting with Yellowstone to Yukon, and I don't know why the video doesn't switch, I think, or I don't know if, if it's just me not seeing it. But anyway, um, the books always have been a wonderful basis, um, kind of the foundation to build a broader outreach campaign. And so we were able to create museum exhibits and then also do meetings right on Capitol Hill where you actually talk to, you know, people that can actually make the real difference. And, and uh, so for us, building the connection with conservation organizations, with the local communities, whether it's in the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor or with the uh, Gwich'in uh, people was always very essential. And uh, what I loved is how the books always were that central core that made this possible, that allowed 
for that broader outreach campaign. Thanks. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I can definitely add to that. And this is, this is a, a question I can be very positive about. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, these, these books are, they are incredible, powerful communications tools. Um, they allow our partner groups, you know, so say conservation organizations that I might be partnering with, um, sometimes government agencies I've partnered with, uh, just kind of depends, uh, you know, on the book and the, and the subject itself. But it, it allows these groups to bring people together and have conversations and, you know, talk about these issues and do so in an engaging way. Um, but I, I always say, uh, you know, you know, people ask me, well, how many books have you sold? And for me, that's just so, I don't even think about it like that. That is so the wrong question. For me, it should be, who has seen your book? You know, you know, whose hands is it getting into? Um, for me, that's, that's definitely how I want the books used. And as Florian was saying, you know, these books find their ways into the hands of senators, Congress people, presidents, uh, heads of government agencies that are managing and making decisions about our public lands. Um, so that's always, for me, that's the, I think, one of the highest and best uses of the book. And, um, but in addition to that, you know, the books themselves, um, they tell stories. And stories help human beings make sense of their world, and they help us relate to our world. And I'm always trying to tell stories that help people radically imagine. I'm a big believer about radical imagination. So I'm trying to tell stories that help people radically imagine a different way of living, you know, a better way of living, a way that we can all be thinking about or working towards. And I like to highlight people who are already doing those things. Um, because I, I'm just a strong believer if we're not if we're not really radically imagining, you know, how we want the world to go and how, what our place is in it, you know, we won't get there. Um, so that's, uh, to me, another very powerful thing about these books. Um, they change people's perspectives, they change people's minds, um, they kind of give people a pathway, you know, into a different way um, of thinking. So it's, it's a, for me, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to work on books like this. Uh, with Braided River uh, and the Mountaineers. And I'm just thrilled, you know, that I've been able to do it. And so are we, that's a wonderful perspective. And I know that we've seen Florian's images um, in the news media, the Today Show, National Geographic, just a lot over the last few weeks as the um, decisions on the Arctic um, National Wildlife Refuge have come out. So. Thank you both for what you do. I have, um, we've gotten some great questions in the chat and uh, we're gonna get to them in just a minute. But um, before we do, I have one more question for all of you. Um, so the Mountaineers, are, our outdoor education programs have been helping folks get outside for over a century now, connecting people to place. And we're unique in that we also provide our community with opportunities to take action on issues that threaten these places that they love. What experiences have you had uh, that leads you to believe that time outside is part of the solution? John, how about we start with you? <laughs> well, I think the key with any question we talk about with climate change, with advocacy, with anything is, is preparing the next generation, helping them understand what's happening and preparing them in terms of uh, experience outdoors, uh, some of the Mountaineers, the training that the Mountaineers provides, uh, the opportunities to get out and do research. Um, all of those things are helping create that next generation that's going to move forward because we all grew up with a certain kind of environmental background and people today, young people today are growing up with a different environmental background and we need, as each generation goes, we have to uh, learn to deal with the next one and I think that's what the Mountaineers has been wonderful at and but at the end of the day if you don't go outside if you don't understand how wonderful the world is you don't feel that visceral need to protect it and you don't understand why people care about how many whales are left or anything else so at the end of the day the motivation that the outdoors provides um, is what you need to maintain that fire to uh, continue fighting what can seem like a losing battle but at the end of the day we have to win because um, you know, this is, we only have one planet and we have to do the best we can to protect it. And the mountains really are that first battleground as we uh, look towards what the future can look like. And the more we understand it, the more we can get people out there to work in that area, 
uh, the better we are going to be able to protect uh, everywhere else. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Conrad, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, um, getting outdoors is great and the, um, what we enjoy with it. And it's probably that it's an intrinsic uh, experiential reward that we get from it. It's not a material thing that we're out to uh, sort of acquire. And then when you're outdoors, you have to thermoregulate probably four times a day as you're hiking or climbing and, and the, the temperature is always changing. So you have a, a very real firsthand experience with the uh, environment. And that might not be the same if your recreation is indoor or it might yeah. be uh, yeah, I think. With, with a vehicle or something like that. So um, and then kind of combining both of those, you have a, uh, a, a sense of appreciation and understand the, uh, the full, um, how intertwined our existence is with that being outdoors. So healthy outdoors equates to healthy humanity. I don't know if I can jump in here. For me, it's definitely the next generation, the kids, um, like just a chance to go outdoors with them, taking them to the refuge. And it also gives me hope because um, for them, everything is exciting out in nature when they, you know, see a little ground squirrel, you know, hiding away or, you know, the migrating birds that are coming through, you know, it doesn't need to be a rare bird. Every bird is a special bird and every mountain view is exciting. We just hiked up to the Harding ice field the other day and they just sprinted up the mountain and we're just so in it. And so for me, you know, just again, reinforcing for me that fight, which is the right fight so that future generations can still have the healthiest planet possible. And at the same time, you know, in a way, looking back and reminding us again and again, how beautiful the planet still is so that we don't get just depressed at the same time that we really are encouraged by keeping the fight going because we need to now more than ever. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Florian. Yeah, I, I think for me, you know, the more time I spend outdoors, um, you know, really has helped me understand uh, my place in the world and what it means to be human and what it just means to be. And um, over the years, I, I think all that time spent outdoors has really helped me connect to my true nature and to my, mer to my very best self. And what a world we could all live in if everybody you know, was out there doing that exact same thing. You know, if we're, if we're our best selves, I don't think we'd be in the mess that we're in right now. <laughs> So yes, outdoors is always a great thing. Great. We 100% agree here, the Mountaineers. <laughs> Thanks everyone for those great answers. We're going to um, shift to questions from our audience. And um, the, first, the first question that we have is for Conrad. And it's from Charlie Michelle. And he, uh, he's one of our fantastic donors and volunteers who's really passionate about um, reducing our organizational carbon footprint. So that's what the topic of his question is about. Uh, the Mountaineers have taken a number of steps to address our own carbon footprint, but one area we've struggled to get traction is around travel. Last night that you, you mentioned that you often purchase carbon offsets for travel. One of our attendees mentioned that a local tree planting service claims a $5 per ton offset cost but the tree growth and sequestration rate takes something like 27 years for a tree to sequester one ton of carbon. Do you have any advice for folks tonight about what to look for when purchasing offsets to ensure that they are really having their intended impact, especially given the urgency of the climate crisis? Yeah, and thank you, uh, Charles, for the question on that. And I am not as well um, informed as I should be on that. There's, um, I do it to the, um, uh, through my company and, and we're working with that. So most of my uh, international travel and um, professional travel um, with a, the variety of those. But um, there is, um, we can affect, um, 
uh, tree planting, then it's uh, it's a start with that and where the um, where that goes. And it, it, what that brings up is that when we're it's a uh, voluntary carbon tax and a carbon tax when we price what coal and, and carbon fuel is to the environment and the overall costs, then we're better off at it. And we're starting with this. So if we use that as a framework and um, I appreciate the Mountaineers looking into it and coming up with that data and that, which is, um, I will become a more informed um, advocate for um, these programs. Thanks, Conrad. Any of our, of our other panelists have anything to add about carbon offsets? Do you uh, offset your travel? Florian, do you? Yeah, so far I've just basically gone online and just, you know, purchased different uh, carbon offsets. We also started with a colleague of mine. I'm part of a photography group that tours Germany and we started um, collecting money to reforestation in an area of Brazil uh, where there's a special kind of a um, or type of rainforest vegetation so that many of these areas get uh, basically be, uh, regrown um, to also um, allow for the golden crown monkeys. I think, I, I think that's a species, I forgot right now if it's the correct English word for it, but anyway, um, I still love the idea of, for example, there's the children's uh, rainforest and so on, and we've supported them in some of our events in, in Germany. Um, I would love the idea of actually building an alliance and knowing where trees are being planted and having a certain kind of influence. And I've played around of, you know, with the idea, you know, we're doing this with this other colleague, like I said, in Brazil, but I think this could happen on a much bigger scale where one actually knows which trees are being grown and, and how it's done in a responsible way. Because a lot of times what otherwise happens with the carbon um, uh, offset is that just existing forests that maybe wouldn't even be cut, period, just get you know funded. But I mean, what? It, of course it's important to maintain those, but at the same time, I think if we can actually revitalize areas and reforest areas, that would even be more, more powerful. Oh, thanks for that. Um, on the topic of forests, we had some um, unfortunate news today, and we have a question about that from David in the audience. Um, Amy and Florian, reaction to the U.S. administration's announcement today that they are about to open 7 million acres of the 16 million acres in the Tongass to development, roads, logging, et cetera, reversing the Clinton administration's roadless rules for that area. Yeah, I can certainly speak to that. So my first book um, called Salmon in the Trees was all about the Tongass National Forest. Um, I will say, ever since this roadless rule was passed, and I want to say 20 years ago, um, I believe, um, there have always been attempts uh, to reverse it uh, for the state of Alaska, uh, for the Tongass National Forest um, in particular. Um, this isn't the first time I think that we've gotten this far and down this road. Yes, it's not a great announcement uh, that we had today. I am hopeful though, every single time that rule, this rule has been challenged, um, it's always ended up in the courts and it has always held uh, when it came to the state of Alaska and the Tongass National Forest. So, um, I like that, Amy. <laughs> Positive thinking. We're not going to let this go. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not. And I just, I have to, I mean, this is one, this is one, you know, area where I am hopeful that it's going to stand again. It will end up in court again. And I, I it's stood for 20 years ever since it passed. And I, I just have to hope that it's going to continue to stand. Now, of course, we all have to put, you know, ridiculous amounts of pressure, uh, like we always do, and we will uh, again. So yeah, not a great announcement, but I, again, I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, Alaskans don't want this, you know, it's most people don't want to see this happen. So it's just, it's a handful of powerful people. Yeah, I think 96% of the comments were in opposition. Um, mm -hmm. John, you look like you had something to say there. Well, one of my hats that I wear is I'm also a lawyer. And so I've taught a lot of environmental law to, um, to a lot of people and written a lot of law review articles and so forth on topics like this and the key difference that is happening right now and it's been happening for the last few months is 
you can change any rule if you go through the formal rulemaking process and it takes about three years to get it done. And so what's happened in this case is they've actually done it legally. So there's no court challenge to make, unfortunately. So that's really the why voting is so critical at this point, because a lot of these processes take three, four, five years and they take a while to get started. And so if we cut them off right now, there's still time to reverse a lot of this stuff. But if a new administration comes in, it's gonna take three, four years to bring that rule back. And so again, the, a lot of the safeguards we've had in the past, if you're determined to destroy something, you can do it legally, but it takes three to four years. And so that's why voting is so critical. Absolutely, 100%. Um, so on the topic of, uh, of voting and, and different perspectives of, on climate change, we have a question from Dave. And um, Dave says, Alaskans see climate change in their daily life. As was noted, Iowans don't or don't believe they do. Have any of you found a compelling message that gets the attention of Iowans or fill in the blank of, of people who might not, um, you know, see the impacts and feel the impacts of climate change? I think one has to basically gather the weather data and just show the amount of flooding, the amount of storms, the amount of, you know, weird weather situations, everything from, you know, sudden cold spells as well as extended drought. And I think it becomes very evident. And I think it's already just as visible there. One has to just understand the data. The problem overall is, you know, in some areas, if you have earlier spring and people are like, oh, wow, this is great. Now this feels already, you know, like further south or even, you know, in Germany where I come from, it's like, oh, wow, it's like Italy now. Like we can walk around in shorts in April. But, you know, we have extended droughts even there. So I think it's just basically sensi sensitizing people anywhere in the world and making the connections, how the fires, how the hurricanes, which seems totally obvious, but how they are a lot more tied into um, the, the, the accelerating climate crisis. And I think that's, you know, maybe with, you know, finding different ways, like through the books and other ways of telling the science stories over and over again. Um, I think that's the best way to go about it. <laughs> I always raise my head like I'm a student. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Um, well, the thing that I've had a lot of success with is because people say, well, are humans causing climate change? There all these, there's all these questions that the press sort of and politicians throw out or confusion, confusing uh, ideas that get thrown out. And the, what I do is I just try and take it back a step and being kind of a science nerd, it's pretty easy just to say, look, it's physics. We know that when you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it does X, just like gravity or anything else. And so the more carbon dioxide you have in the atmosphere, it has to lead to more heat in the atmosphere. And that heat in the atmosphere is what we don't understand. You know, it, maybe it's gonna lead to a drought in the Midwest. Maybe it's gonna lead to more um, malaria in Texas and in Florida. Um, maybe it's gonna lead to all these different things. But at the end of the day, it's just a question of physics and where, um, when you look at where carbon dioxide comes from, um, it just circles through the environment. The only place that it, there's, you can have new carbon dioxide is from where the earth is stored it deep under the crust. When you bring fossil fuels up, it has to add more carbon dioxide to the air. And so in those kind of simple physics terms, you know, there's no real argument about the uh, greenhouse effect. Without the greenhouse effect, there'd be no life on earth. Our distance from the sun is such that uh, all the oceans would be frozen without a greenhouse effect. And obviously no water, no humans, no nothing. So we know that it happens. We know that it's physics that's driving it. And we know that the only place this could be coming from is either fossil fuels or some magic fairy dust that's created it. And so the question is, what's going to happen in the future? And if you've got any, when you see things like a drought in Iowa or in Texas, or fires in all these different places. What you have to understand is what the climate change is doing is it's taking natural processes and just making them worse. So maybe it would have been a small drought in Iowa, but instead you lost half your cows 
or you lost half your field. And 20 years from now, you'll lose 90% of your field. And so in Canada, that's where they'll be uh, growing all the wheat in the future. So. Thanks, John. Our next question um, from, comes from um, Katya. And uh, she says, you say that the next generation of people being outdoors is necessary to fight against climate change. Yet a big diversity issue that we encounter nowadays is the gatekeeping mentality of outdoor enthusiasts trying to keep their special places to themselves and not share the wilderness with others. Can you speak to this? How can we encourage responsible outdoor recreation without falling victim to gatekeeping discrimination? Maybe Conrad, I'm gonna pick on you to kick us yeah. off. Well, thank you for that. And um, so, um, yeah, that's people are protective of uh, their favorite recreation areas, and it is um, by definition um, in what the demographic of it is. But if we can look at where national parks are and the ability for people to experience outdoor recreation, there's um, something within two hours of every place in the United States that one can have an overnight uh, camping experience. So part of that is making it. Um, popular with people um, and making it accessible, having role models to bring people out there. And um, it's certainly one of the challenges that um, we're facing. And with the, um, the, the social injustice of George Floyd and the, the civil unrest that we're now experiencing, we see now the intersectionality between climate and how it disproportionately affects uh, BIPOC communities. And so the more that we can extend our uh, work and where we are as outdoor enthusiasts and scientists to these communities and bring them into it, they will become advocates for what we do. So, um, yeah, we're, um, it's, a, it's a great point and it's not uh, limited to the United States, it extends throughout the world um, in all the cultures. So, um, it's something that as um, we move forward that we can make decisions that will help us along those lines. Thanks, Conrad. It's a really important point. And um, I personally want to thank you for all you've done to speak out against um, systemic racism recently um, using your platform. And that's there's such a huge intersection between um, systemic racism and the climate crisis. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, they're, they're um, respect. And so, yeah, we're, let, let's, um, think of everyone who we are and where we will be. And so how do, you, how do your actions change that? So thank you. Florian, did you wanna pipe in? <clears throat> yeah, I guess here in Alaska, you know, for example, getting to remote areas is definitely a, a, a big privilege. And I've been thinking about this a lot, especially during this pandemic right now, We've been just actually staying a lot in Anchorage and just gone to the local city park, uh, you know, hiking through the forest there and being able to just go down to the ocean. And once in a while we get lucky, we see a bald eagle or some belugas uh, swim by. And going back to children, I think it reminds me again and again, you know, how much excitement you find into just the local little things. And, and that gives me, um, enthusiasm and sharing it with them. So I think for once, you know, we don't have to go to the Masai Mara or we don't have to travel halfway around the world. There's many hidden wonders. I'm of course very fortunate. That's why I live here that I have this huge Alaska backyard. Um, but I think, you know, in many different places, just like Conrad said, I think it's closely tied with economics, whether people can afford to even go just for a weekend to a national park and others. And I think we can only encourage, you know, a more diverse group. My wife is from Mexico. She grew up in Mexico City and she didn't have a lot of opportunities to get into wild places. But once she discovered them for herself, she's one of the most enthusiastic people about it. And so are our children now. And I think sometimes it needs those, you know, examples out of the different groups of saying, wow, you know, what an amazing thing to go for a camping trip and so on and, and uh, to encourage others to do so. And of course, we do need to fight for our public lands and, and have more places available where people can 
get into the wild or get out in nature because we can already see how the national parks in so many places are overcrowded. And I understand why people say, well, let's not make every little corner public so it gets overrun. And so I think it has to be a, a certain balance. And I understand that, you know, some people earn hard to find their secret little spots and, but everybody, you know, can get out and well, and do it. And again, finding these little jewels right close to home, even if it is in a, in a, a city city park. Um, I think that's kind of the way to do it. Um, I, I remember so often that the kids, they play outside right now. We don't have, you know, a chance to get help. So they have to entertain themselves for hours outside in the yard. And once in a while, they come running up with excitement, bring a little worm, you know, that they found and they think it's the coolest thing or um, just little tiny little surprises. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it's, giving people a chance to get out and encouraging especially the young generations of all ethnic backgrounds maybe through scholarships or, or field trips in schools and other ways to discover the outdoors because we for example don't allow the use of ipads or anything kids don't watch tv and so they're forced to entertain themselves in nature but it's such an amazing thing you know what they all can discover and, and i wish it just that more kids can can get that opportunity Thanks, Florian. I think that's a really important point about, um, you know, as, as mountaineers, we love getting into the mountains and the wild places, but it's equally as important to, if not more important, to have access to parks and green space right near our homes, because um, those are the places that, that most people have to, to recreate in. So thanks for that. Amy or John, did you want to pipe in there? Sure. I'll, I'll say something. Because I don't, the, the notion of a gatekeeper, I find a little objectionable. I, I think we do a really great job of creating a spectrum of access, inter, or access the wrong word, protection. Um, because we go from baseball and soccer fields to parks where you can go hiking, to national recreation areas, to national forests, to national parks, to wilderness areas. So we have a spectrum of protection. And that, you know, if you want to protect some areas, you uh, create more rules to do that protection. What I found is, I mean, when I was a, a student, I was a dirt bag climber, and we would fly into San Francisco and try to get to Yosemite. We didn't have a car or anything. We were poor. We couldn't afford to uh, rent a car. And trying to use public transportation to get from you know, uh, San Francisco to Yosemite was impossible. And so I think that is a much bigger gatekeeper is the lack of transportation to most areas and the lack of time off. People just don't have, you know, three day weekends and stuff to go uh, gallivanting off, especially if you don't have a car, if, if you're dependent on public transportation. So finding societal ways to empower people, um, I think will lead to a lot more open access to these things rather than you know, sort of pitting us against, a, oh, you're a gatekeeper, you're not allowing these other people to enter. Um, there's a lot of other sort of structural impediments as well. And I think we've done a good job of creating that spectrum of things that are in the neighborhood, things that are in the region, and then things that are uh, you know, more protected further away. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll just add to that, you know, this, this summer, um, you know, depending on where you live, um, certainly saw, I think, more people than I've ever seen in my entire lifetime getting out, whether it's to national forests or local parks or wherever they could, and recreating. And my biggest concern after seeing a lot of, you know, just this higher volume, um, a lot of, these were a lot of people like very new uh to say trails like they hadn't been out and done this before and the impacts the negative impacts um that I, I think a lot of us you know we're seeing you know just you know trash and human waste and um you know so i guess how do we how do we do a better job you know of educating um new people you know which again i, I always want new people into the fold because hopefully it will make advocates out of them and um, you know, they will, they'll be advocating for our public lands, but how do we, how do we educate? How do we help them understand, you know, the leave no trace ethics, you know, that a lot of us grew up with doing, um, you know, it, ignorance is, is, uh, it's, it's the first hurdle, you know, usually that, that we have to do. So 
I'm not sure what the answer is, but I've been hearing from people all over the country that they've been seeing, you know, just increased use, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but just all the, the impacts that go with that. So I'd love to see the Mountaineers uh, do some do some serious education on all these new folks uh, that are that are coming in. And again, turn them into advocates and stewards. Um, if they're already out there, you know, that's probably half the half the battle of getting them, you know, into advocates. So let's work on that. Yeah, you are definitely um, preaching our mission statement for sure. <laughs> um, and that's something that, that we've had conversations about as a staff and a board a lot this summer is, is how do we get all these new people coming out into the outdoors, which is wonderful, but how do we get them um, educated on Leave No Trace and, and um, prepared to, to do whatever they want to do in the outdoors? So thanks for mentioning that. Well, and they also need to do it safely. And again, that's one of the things that the Mountaineers excels at is, you know, I work with search and rescue and we've had an incredible explosion of, of cases because so many new people, again, the bars are closed, they don't have anything to do. So they go out in the woods and um, they, don't, they don't have that training. And again, that's what the Mountaineers can really help uh, do, I think in the future is find ways to provide that safety uh, training as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's fantastic as well as kind of maybe, you know, maybe uh, the ethics of heading out in the outdoors or, or something, because now, just like you said, you know, you see people running around with boom boxes through the wilderness, you know, and, and, you know, things like that, or that also maybe to do it in a more lower impact. So you don't have to take your home with you on the road and everybody has to be in a bus like RV to, you know, to explore nature. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's an interesting, you know, project or, or book title or something, how to find a, kind of a new ways of experiencing uh, nature in a more uh, low key or low impact way. Thanks, Florian. Our next uh, question, I think, is one that, that Conrad told me he specifically wanted to, to answer. And this question is from Edward. Uh, he says, in this day and age, focusing political energy and prioritizing advocacy can be challenging for a layperson. What strategies do you personally or professionally use to stay focused? What specific activities occupy the majority of your climate advocacy efforts? Um, yeah, thank you. So, Edward, for the question. Um, something uh, they always say, what are the, the first steps that we can do towards, um, towards climate? And it always comes up recycling and people check that box and then they might not do uh, further steps. So it's important that recycling is like brushing our teeth. If it becomes a habit, we just do it and we do it to the best we can, understanding its limitations and, and things with that. But to... Um, to see a, a larger scale change, we're going to need to see um, our a societal change. And we're gonna to need to have market externalities and those are created by legislative action. So being aware of um, how um, our climate is connected to that of the United States and where we are um, on a, a multitude of issues from the um, Paris Climate Accords to uh, um, the transition to a electrical economy, um, or electrical energy generation, renewable generation. So that speed and going with that, but um, being aware of it and then um, uh, making the people that I'm with, we have these conversations. And so the challenge is, is that there's not many people that I interact with that are like, oh, this is, you don't see the, the things the way we do. Um, say if I'm out trail running or bouldering, we might encounter, um, uh, people that are into motorized recreation, which is a different group, and and having that conversation with them would be um, an end goal in trying to uh, to get them within that. But um, it's um, I see it as uh, it's our responsibility to future generations, and that uh, like all good challenges, there's hard work. So um, and, and just get motivated with it. Thanks, Conrad. Any other panelists interested in, in answering that question? I, I you know, I, the first part of that question, how do you stay focused? 
I think that's a really great question. Um, you know, how do you stay focused on anything, especially right now, you know, you know, with COVID and, but you know, even pre COVID, um, you know, we are living in a world where we are just bombarded. I mean, information overload and it comes from, it comes from all over. I mean, I'm like Florian, I don't have a television. Um, you know, I try and limit my screen time. And while I stay informed, I try and limit, you know, the volume of news and noise, you know, that's out there. Um, and I still feel, you know, overwhelmed at times because uh, it's just it's coming at us rapid fire um, um, all the time. So staying focused for me, getting outdoors. Um, the second I'm outdoors and I don't bring a phone, I don't bring any electronics with me. The second I'm out there, just, you know, the mind quiets and, you know, and, and then that's when I can, you know, breathe and I have space and, um, and, and it's really when I look around and I crawl out of my own cluttered brain and, and I, you know, I just look up and I look around and I'm in trees and it's like, this is what matters. I mean, this is so what matters, you know, being connected again, I, I go back to that, you know, being outside, being in nature connects us to our true nature, you know, so to, again, outdoors time is, is absolutely key. And then, and then how do we connect to each other? Because that's absolutely crucial too. Um, you know, in this time of COVID, you know, I've realized just, I mean, I've always known, but I think it's just, you know, there's an exclamation point to everything, right, with COVID. And it's just this idea of being connected to a community. And, and I'll go back, you know, and I'm not trying to be a billboard for the Mountaineers, but, <laughs> you know, it's an incredible community, right? And, you know, so stay connected, you know, to folks in your local Mountaineers group. Everybody's found ways to you know, do Zoom events, if, any, if anything, we're over Zoom, right? <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> but maybe that's not a bad thing if we're connecting with community. Um, I know, you know, just seeing your faces here, uh, you know, tonight, you know, the panelists and knowing, you know, uh, thank you to all the attendees for tuning in. I mean, you, you give me hope. Um, the fact that you took this time out, you know, to be here on on, on a climate, you know, panel, which isn't necessarily the most uplifting topic, you know, in the world, but you're here and which means you care. Um, so uh, that, that gives me a lot of hope. And, and again, just staying connected to each other and, and knowing that, you know, nobody wants to live in a degraded world. I mean, I, I don't know anybody who does. Um, I, and I don't think that they do. And so um, I think as John mentioned, you know, uh, uh, leaders, leaders matter, uh, and so we have we've got to uh, we've got to support uh, new leaders um, who can create the kind of world that we all want to be in. Because that's what's needed, in my opinion. That's what's needed more than anything on climate and climate advocacy is real leadership, which I think we've just been lacking not only in our own country but uh, around the world as well. And it's not like people aren't trying; we are, but we really need real leaders uh, to step up. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, I know so many good points there. We're, we're missing the Mountaineers community a lot. Um, and we do our best to do these in-person events, which are wonderful. But I know people are missing getting together at the program center and seeing their friends. So thanks for that. I'm going to ask um, one more question from the audience um, before we get to our final wrap up question. Um, and it's from Jim Burke. And he says, what do we need to do to convince the organizations that we are members of to reduce their fossil fuel use by 50% by 2030 required to keep the temperature below 1.5 Celsius rise? John, do you want to start us off as our resident scientist? I don't think you're going to want to hear my answer because cutting our fossil fuel use 50% is not going to keep us at 1.5% uh, degree rise. Uh, basically, if we want to keep it at 1.5%, I mean, 1.5 degrees, we got to stop all fossil fuel use, unfortunately. So, um, so again, that, but that's not the answer that you want to hear in terms of something so negative, because we do have to take steps. And the sooner we can reduce our fossil fuel, we at least make more of a gentle runway than having the catastrophic impacts. And it's, COVID has provided a really nice, and that's terrible to put it that way, um, but example of how dealing with something early helps you um, um, mitigate the impacts down the road. 
Uh, we saw the countries who took care of uh, their citizens by being very proactive once COVID began to spread and they limited the impacts and it had, uh, whereas the countries that sort of ignored it or, you know, in the case of Italy and Spain played a soccer game <laughs> with uh, lots of people and then suddenly your uh, citizens are all ill. So uh, ignoring the problem doesn't make it go away and the sooner we can address it, the better. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, that's what has to happen. In terms of our individual organizations, um, I don't know of too many that don't understand the problem and are trying to um, deal with it. I mean, like the American Alpine Club I'm part of, I'm on the Climate, for, uh, climate Change Task Force, um, and they're actively taking steps to uh, deal with that. Um, unfortunately, it's the kind of larger society that isn't part of these conservation organizations that we really have to address. And again, at the end of the day, it really comes down to, I, I hate to be political, but it comes down to politics and uh, voting for and finding ways to support um, uh, laws and regulations that uh, create the world that you want to live in. Thanks, John. Anyone else have thoughts on, on that question? Well, I'm gonna um, kick us over to our last question of the evening, um, which comes from Bruce. And Bruce would love to hear from all of our panelists on how they maintain their optimism and hope during such troubling times. So um, what gives you hope? Let's uh, start with Amy. Uh, well, you know, like, like I just mentioned, um, all of you, Again, all of you tuning in and caring and, and spending your time this way, uh, for sure. Another thing that gives me hope is um, that there is a climate movement and that the world is at least talking about this. Um, this was not the case not too many years ago. You know, not too long ago, I wouldn't have said, oh, there's a climate movement and the world's talking about this. Um, there wasn't. And, and again, that's not too long. So, and we're beyond the point of having the conversation of is, is climate change real or isn't, you know, we're, we're past that. We're so past that conversation, um, you know, so, so that gives me hope. But the other thing that really gives me hope is seeing young people, um, this is their entryway into activism, is climate. And for them, it's not just about the environment. You know, this is, and, and most of them that I've talked to would never really even, they, they wouldn't even identify as, as, you know, what they would think of as an environmentalist. You know, they, what I like about the climate movement is that they see it in a much more holistic way. They see it as, you know, a social justice issue. Um, they do see it as, you know, a quality of life, but they're not just kind of compartmentalizing and saying, I want to save, you know, the place where I like to go climb or something like that. It's, it's, um, it's nice to see, for me, um, young people thinking in this way, because I think we need a whole lot more holistic thinking. You know, all the sciences, you know, working together, all the different, you know, everybody working, uh, you know, on their and they're part of the elephant, I guess, you know, to put all these pieces together. So, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons for hope, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and I have many and I could go on and on, but let's, let's hear from everyone else. How about you, Florian? <clears throat> I think the world was at the edge and was just in front of like major catastrophe over and over again at different times. I do, feel that if humanity wants to kind of get ahead and really starts wrapping their mind around it, that they're capable of achieving incredible things. Um, I do think that we need to recognize that climate change is one of the biggest threats to human life and, and societies and democracies and every, everything as we know it on the planet right now. And we just kind of have to keep on you know, educating more people about it, because in part, I think it is still the misinformation, just that, you know, creating doubt and all of that. And if people have watched that film, Social Dilemma, it just even shows how social media and Google and many other ways find so many ways of allowing those groups to still continue on 
you know, learning or supporting these untruths. And so I think, again, I do believe in resiliency of humankind. And even though I'm absolutely sure that the world will look very differently, it's not a hopeless world. Uh, we still need to fight for what's left. And so again, for me, I can't afford not to have hope. Um, I, you know, I want to see a future for my children. And um, I just hope that that the ingenuity of people um, and, you know, will bring us all, all together. But like Amy said, first is actually recognizing that there's an absolute serious problem. And I just hope that we don't need fire season after fire season and hurricane after hurricane and, and these problems on all levels nonstop. You know, if, if it's the arsonists that cause it and not climate change, if it's like, I don't know what the reason for the hurricanes is supposed to be, but if I hear these kinds of, you know, logic that I, you know, that's propagated still through the news media, that's what's shocking to me. So I think the root in that is education and we can achieve that. So that gives me hope. <laughs> the industriousness of the people, if we aim that in the right direction, um, coupled with the proper education, that gives me hope. Thanks, Florian. I, I liked what you said, I can't afford not to have hope. That's important to, to remember. John, what about you? So, I mean, humans live in the hottest deserts of the world. We live in the coldest areas. We live at high elevations. We've survived ice ages. We're incredibly adaptable. Um, and which is part of the problem, really. We've adapted the world to fit how we want it to look. Um, and what a lot of scientists, what we're sort of waiting for, especially in the US is sort of that Pearl Harbor moment, that moment when we decide it actually means something to all of us. And it unfortunately is gonna have to be some sort of major kick uh, in the butt to really push people forward. But we are adaptable, we'll find ways to deal with it. We've got the technology, we've got the, and the key is just gonna be engaging people and building that passion. And again, when you look at kids today, I mean, the next generation, they care. They've been indoctrinated their whole lives about the problems that they're going to face as adults. And they're ready to start face dealing with those. And they're ready to uh, treat that as important. And uh, they're angry at us for not taking care of them now. And so I think the next generation gives us that hope. And as a species, we have the adaptability to do what we need to do. It's just a question of making that commitment and doing it. Thanks, John. Conrad, you're closing us out here. <laughs> uh, no <hope>. pressure. <laughs> so, um, well, we can hope that um, we see cultural change with the youth in the world's religious organizations to understand the severity and the immediacy of climate change and by working through those, um, we change the business framework that will allow us to um, thrive and live on a sustainable planet. So it's um, seeing that hope in, in with the uh, communities that I mentioned. So <laughs> that's, uh, and then being here and getting outdoors and <laughs> the, the good, good things that we have in life. Great. That was a wonderful way to wrap up. Thank you all. And just thank you so much to our panelists for an incredibly insightful and fascinating, inspiring conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I also want to extend a huge thank you to everyone in attendance tonight for your generous support of the Mountaineers. The conservation and advocacy work done by the Mountaineers, Mountaineers Books, and Braided River are all significantly supported by philanthropic donors just like yourselves. Many folks in the audience tonight choose to support our work through unrestricted Peak Society gifts. Others help fund impacts they're passionate about, including carbon footprint reduction efforts like installing solar panels, and joining the pod to help launch a book and a campaign to protect Puget Sound orcas. We're proud to offer tonight's event at no cost as a special thank you for your philanthropic support of the Mountaineers. Given the financial impacts of COVID-19, we are especially grateful for your continued 
and for many of you, increased giving during this difficult year. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program. If you feel inspired to bolster our collective conservation and advocacy efforts, we've set up a giving page for you to do so. I believe you'll see that link in the chat and definitely in a follow-up email soon. Also included in that email will be some information about a few small actions you can take to help improve climate outcomes through the support of the Mountaineers conservation and advocacy work. This work is only possible with the support of you, our donors. We'll, we're deeply grateful for the generosity of our community and invite you to learn more about how you can support this important work if you're so inspired. But before you leave us tonight, we'd like to show a brief trailer for one of those exciting projects, the Arctic, our last great wilderness. This giant screen film was co-directed by Florian and it's part of a dynamic impact campaign from the uh, Campion Advocacy Fund and Braided River to protect the Arctic. This impact campaign, as well as continuing to support the Salmon Way are two of Braided River's major areas of focus in the years ahead. Florian, did you wanna say a sentence or two about the, about the film? <clears throat> well, I guess, yeah, the film is an attempt to bring actually the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge uh, to the people, a place that I explored and documented for many, many years. Uh, I came there for the first time 20 years ago. And a lot of people misunderstand it. Uh, a lot of people misdescribe it from the flat white nothingness to the barren wasteland. And for me, it was my greatest ambition to actually show what an incredible place it is with full of life, especially with the uh, hundreds of thousands of caribou roaming across these plains. And so, uh, for me, it's been wonderful to work with Braided River and uh, uh, Campion Advocacy Fund um, to create this film. Um, and it all started out with one of my first books, you know, I don't know, I said 15 years ago uh, with Yellowstone to Yukon. So for me, it's been a wonderful partnership with both Mountaineers and Braided River. I can't thank uh, you all enough. So, yeah. Wonderful. All right, here it is. Screen sharing. In the far north is a magical place that few have ever seen. Join National Geographic photographer Florian Schultz on a journey into a true wilderness. What draws me here is one of the most beautiful wild places left on our planet. This is a sanctuary of incredible diversity. the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Experience this adventure. Discover how each of us is connected to this special place. wonder worth protecting the arctic our last great wilderness coming soon that was incredible thank you everyone for attending tonight thanks so much and have a great night